Welcome. My name is Janet Gabor, and I'm a doctoral candidate in the Department of Materials Science and Engineering. And on behalf of Daniela Solomon, the engineering research librarian from the Calvin Smith Library, and Mohsen Safi, also a fellow doctoral candidate in material science, we would like to welcome you to the Engineering Standards Workshop. I would first like to extend our sincerest appreciation to Arnold Hershon, Associate Provost and University Librarian. If you are here, please stand. Thank you. And thanks to our sponsors, the Kelvin Smith Library, the Graduate Materials Society, the Case School of Engineering, Division of Engineering Leadership and Professional Practice, the Case Alumni Association, the Department of Materials Science and Engineering, and the Graduate Student Council. Their generous support has made this workshop possible. The workshop materials are available for download from the researchguides.case.edu as shown on the slide. And the video of this event will be uploaded in approximately two to three weeks and available again on the library website. Today's workshop is meant to provide an introduction to standards and their impact on our daily lives. We are fortunate to have representatives from some of the major standards bodies in the world with us today. They serve a variety of industries, and what we're going to learn today is about the importance of these standards, how they affect our research, our education, and opportunities for professional development from a student perspective. The second half of the talk will look at the user perspective and academia, how these standards are important in the classroom, what benefit it is for students, whether you're an undergraduate student or a graduate student, to learn about these standards and be able to use the library resources to access these kinds of documents. So to start off our program, I would like to introduce our event moderator, Bradley Lurch. He is from NASA Glenn Research Center. He's currently employed in the high temperature smart alloys branch at NASA Glenn. And he is responsible for the characterization of materials primarily for lifting and constituent model development. He's involved in a variety of different testing of materials, and he also manages the mechanical test facilities. So if we would please give a warm welcome to Bradley Lurch. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm the moderator for this afternoon's workshop. And just to give you a few quick comments on my experience with standards, uh, there's not a day that goes by uh, when I'm at NASA where I don't look at a standard spec procedure, work instruction, or so forth. I mean, they're very important to us. Uh, when you, uh, particularly for manned space flight, uh, NASA wants to document everything. And, and the first things that you're asked when you're presenting test results is, did you run that test according to the standard? And if so, what was it? So uh, we, we think they're very important. We use them a lot. Uh, so th this uh, workshop, I think, will go a long way in helping you uh, work with standards in the future. So uh, our first speaker today is Hei Cho from the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. Hey. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me to this workshop. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Hei Cho, and I work as a standards director at AMI, or AMI, or the long title is the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. Um, AMI is a professional society, a not-for-profit not association, but we're at the core a standards developing organization, or an SDO, that's how we usually go by. Um, our members are primarily made up of medical device manufacturers and those in the HTM field. HTM stands for Healthcare Technology Management. Um, these encompass biomedical engineers, clinical engineers, and other professionals who work in the hospital and healthcare settings. Amy's mission is to provide leadership to support the healthcare community in the development, management, and use of safe and effective healthcare technology. 
Um, our standards program is ANSI accredited, and we administer international secretariats for various IEC and I ISO um, technical committees. IEC stands for International Electoral Technical Commission, and ISO stands for the International Organization for Standardization. These two groups basically cover most of the standards that are developed internationally. We also administer the U.S. tags for many of these groups. Um, U.S. tags mean uh, it's technical advisory groups or U.S. mirror committees for international work. Um, AIMI has over 130 um, national or domestic committees. And we cover most of the areas in the IEC and ISO groups dealing with healthcare. Um, AIMI is recognized as the SDO for international and national medical device and process standards. So I wanted to show you some of the scopes in our program, standards program. Some of the newer areas are interoperability, software, uh, robots for surgery, home care environment, combination products, sustainability. Um, these are some of the new areas that we're, we're tackling for standardization. We strongly believe in the one product, one standard, one test worldwide. And that's why we work so strongly with ANSI, IEC, ISO, as well as other standards organizations. And two of the more popular standards products that we published are standards, which we develop a lot of these standards um, as US standards or American national standards, especially in the sterilization field. However, we adopt many of the international standards as well. Um, and so the US or the American national standards are the same as they are in the international arena under the IEC or ISO. Um, there are instances for deviations so I don't know if you guys are that familiar with different standards, but IEC 60601-1 is a very big standard that a lot of the medical manufacturers follow. Well, U.S. had to do its own deviations because of the national electrical codes involved. TIRs, or technical information reports, um, are developed to cover issues which are very current and or maybe narrower in scope. The intention usually is to publish the TIR first and then develop them into a standard at a later time. So here's a brief outline of our, how our standards process is developed. It goes from proposals to drafting to commenting, balloting, public review, uh, final re approval, and publication. So the main question is, who can get involved in standards work? You know, anyone with interests or expertise in the topic can. Um, so for example, in fact, for most of our domestic work, all of the meetings are open to the public. We invite anybody to join our committees. Um, for internationally, though, you do have to be nominated as a US expert. Um, in our field, we have medical device manufacturers, users, clinicians, nurses, HTM, regulatory or government representatives, usually from the FDA, uh, but you know, we welcome different perspectives, and, and the more the better. In fact, having participation from students and young professionals would lend a fresh perspective in, in developing the basic requirements for the medical devices. So we really would like for you to get involved. Um, AMI has a student membership. You don't have to be a member of AMI to join any of the um, standards committees, but we do have a student membership. Usually it's for things like um, attending uh, webinars, educational sessions, or getting any of the publications for a discounted rate. So if you have any questions or want to be involved, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hay. Our next speaker is with ANSI, the American National Standard Institute, and it's Mani Bogatz. Thank you very much, Brad. I appreciate it. First, uh, as a lawyer, I must say I'm very happy to be here representing ANSI, but I'm not an ANSI employee. In my day job, I'm Associate General Counsel for IATMO. We develop plumbing codes and standards for the plumbing and mechanical built industries, as well as test and certify plumbing products. That being said, again, I'm very happy to be here today to talk a little bit about ANSI and specifically the ANSI Committee on Education. 
So first, a little bit of background on ANSI. The American National Standards Institute is a private, nonprofit organization that administers and coordinates the U.S. Voluntary Standards and Conformity Assessment System. In this role, the institute works in close collaboration with stakeholders from both industry and government to identify standards-based solutions to national and global priorities. ANSI fosters the U.S. standardization system by accrediting the procedures of SDOs and approving documents as American national standards. Accreditation as a standards developer represents compliance with an open and equitable consensus development process that protects the rights and interests of every participant through a set of, quote, cardinal principles, those being openness, balance, due process, and consensus. ANSI's impartial third-party audits oversee the integrity of this process, regularly assuring adherence to the Institute's procedures and safeguarding the value of the ANS designation. So that's ANSI. So why does ANSI have a Committee on Education? Well, it all stems from ANSI's belief that technical standards are key to national economy and global commerce. What does the Committee on Education do? This committee looks for opportunities to attract and educate the upcoming generation of U.S. standards professionals. It's about outreach and trying to reach out and um, pass along knowledge and, and build the U.S. standardization system from the ground up. A little bit about the leadership of the committee. There's myself serving as chairman in 2015, our co-chairman Deb Prince from UL, and co-chairman Dr. Steve Elliott from Purdue University, and the committee has more than 70 members representing 23 companies, 22 standards development organizations, three government agencies, 21 educational institutions. And as of 2014, we had six new members. What does this committee do? In 2015, we had a couple of initiatives to try and further our mission. First, we had our fourth annual student paper competition. The theme was Standards Inspire Innovation. Students were asked to use specific examples to demonstrate the part that standards play in boosting business innovation in the U.S. and or around the world. We had a winner, Shane Arlington from Stevens Institute of Technology and William Gabler from NC State. Two cash prizes were awarded, first place 2,000 for Mr. Arlington, second place 1,000 to Mr. Gabler. The winners are invited to attend an education event in Washington, D.C. in conjunction with World Standards Week, which happens in late September every year, and they're also invited to attend an awards dinner. So going forward, if you're interested, all entries must be written and submitted by an enrolled college or university student at the associate, undergraduate, or graduate level in a U.S. academic institute of higher learning. Internships. ANSI expanded its careers page to include internships offered by the standardization community. We're trying to build a resource bridge between ANSI members and universities. ANSI members and other standardization community stakeholders are invited to send any internship opportunities to ANSI for inclusion in the new site. We're trying to connect the disparate entities that are all out in the U.S. standardization system and build any linkages that we can. Standard simulations. In coordination with the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is NIST, we are working on setting up standard simulations throughout 2015. One is setting standards, a simulation exercise in strategy and cooperation in the standardization process. We have fictional, lifelike exercises to expose students to interesting challenges and opportunities in standards work. One such simulation was held May 8th at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and this was for students. On September 30th, during World Standards Week, there's going to be a simulation for emerging standards professionals. This is an opportunity for members of your staff with less than five years of standards experience to engage in a standards education exercise, an opportunity to reach and engage students and faculty from colleges and universities that are not already involved in this committee on education. We have outreach to students. We have outreach to emerging professionals. We try and reach them wherever they are to get them interested in the U.S. standardization scheme. So what does the ANSI, ANSI and the ANSI Community and Education offer to students and professors? Well, ANSI's primary educational tool is the website, Standards Learn. This is a free and publicly available resource providing ANSI-developed educational content to a broad audience, including students and professors. For students, we have the aforementioned paper competition, the standard simulation, as well as free e-learning courses. 
for professors. We offer membership on the committee, networking opportunities, access, free e-learning courses, standardization case studies, and guest lectures. I wanted to make special mention of the university outreach program we have, which makes standards available to educators to build into their curriculum. It's a terrific resource. We can talk about that, Brent. Further initiatives. There's a joint ANSI Committee on Education, U.S. National Committee, Communications and Continuing Education Committee Task Force on Emerging Professionals. This is a multi-year plan for enhanced engagement of students and emerging professionals. Components of this plan include national events, competitions, internships, mentoring, and communications. The goal of this committee, again, is to be out there, to assist, and to try and be a resource from anyone in the US standardization system who's seeking one. At the end here, I have the actual ANSI employee who works on this committee, and her contact information is there should anyone have any further questions, as well as my own contact information will be available. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Monty. Our next speaker is with ASTM International. It's uh, Jeff Atkins. Oh, I liked it because it brought out my eyes, but <laughs> I know you guys are a tough crowd. This is really exciting stuff, standards work. <laughs> but I'm trying to, I'll, I'll do my best, okay? I, like it says here, I'm Jeff Atkins. I've been with ASTM for 15 years. I'm not a technical person, and I manage a wide variety of technical committees. So ASTM, what is ASTM? ASTM is a, you heard the SDO earlier, a standards development organization. It's been around since 1898. It actually started when the railroads were coming across the United States because they had to develop standards for the steel that was being used in the railroads. So that's where ASTM got its initiation. Its first committee is ASTM A1, it's Committee on Steel. Okay, something was mentioned earlier and I've been waiting ever since, you know, the ANSI guy talked too long too, but I, I've been waiting to say this. Somebody mentioned earlier, and I won't say who it was, but that ISO and the IEC were the only international standards development organizations in the world. Uh, she's trying to qualify it now, but, <laughs> but ASTM has worked very hard in all seriousness to become an international standards development organization, and they have been for a number of years. ASTM used to be known as the American Society for Testing the Material, and they changed that name back in 2001. And there's the World Trade Agreement is written as such that there's certain criteria that people have to meet to become an international standards development organization. And ASTM has met all that criteria and continue to work that. And ASTM is a not-for-profit organization, but it gets, sustains itself through the sale of its intellectual property, through the sale of its standards. And more than 50% of its sales of its standards are outside of the United States. Which is, and it's been that way for many years, but it has that stigma associated with it because they see the A and think that's American. So, okay, there's my soapbox for ASTM. Is my time up already? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, that, this, I apologize. We have more than 12,000 standards that ASTM has. Something I like to highlight, you know, I come out, I first got out of the military and I went to work selling aluminum. And I saw ASTM standards stenciled across it, ASTM B something or other. We did a tour earlier today. We went into the, uh, one of the labs, was structures, structures Lab, thank you. And there was a steel beam there, and it said it's ASTM A500, so it's made to ASTM specification. You go into TGIF Fridays, you go into Ruby Tuesdays, you pull out that little box of crayons that you guys probably still color with because you're all in college. And, <laughs> It'll say it conforms to ASTM D4236. So that's an ASTM standard, although they're voluntary consensus standards that was adopted into law, that it, if you're gonna sell an artist material, it has to be labeled if there's any health hazards or such. So you'll see it everywhere. I, I put a swimming pool in my house a number of years ago. The sales brochure had an elephant standing on top of a safety cover, and it said it conforms with AF, ASTM 1536. So you'll see ASTM standards everywhere. Uh, we are across borders across every, we provide everything, safety, 
is a primary concern. You know, standards facilitate trade, so it's important to use those. And all throughout the tour today, we saw that ASTM standards are used quite a bit. What I wanted to highlight here, just is pretty simple. You hear the word standard, and everybody thinks, what's a standard? Well, in the ASTM world, there's six different types of standards, all of equal value. None has more weight than the other. But we have classifications, guides, practices, specifications, terminology standards, and test methods. Probably the most far-reaching standards that ASTM has are the test methods. And ASTM test methods are recognized internationally because they have a precision and bias section that shows how accurate they are to be used and how if they're properly used. And I think that separates us away from or separates us from many other standards development organizations in the world. Am I there? One more okay. <laughs> and we were going to talk about students and stuff, but I got carried away. Um, ASTM has made a, a big effort over the years to get involved with academics. We recognize professors, the year of the professor, and do different things. We provide a, a toolkit for professors to use, whether they use videos, PowerPoints, and different things to promote ASTM's use, and we can get special packages where they can use ASTM standards in their teachings, in their classrooms. Student membership, just to be real quick, anybody can join ASTM, like was mentioned earlier, to join that organization that doesn't recognize international organizations, that there's, but there's all kinds of things that can be involved. There's benefits, and on a serious note, just to highlight a couple of things, there's things here that we say we got some uh, uh, grad, uh, grants and scholarships. Fortunately, for some folks here at Case Western, uh, and it's because they're well-deserving, there are a number of applications, but both Mosin and Janet received $10,000 scholarships from ASTM this year. So, and actually Mosin's a report, re repeat winner because he got it as well last year. So, and that's a result of their efforts and their work here at Case Western and their involvement with ASTM. Okay, just real quick, these are the committees I mentioned, or I, I, I manage, and you can see they're all over the place. We talk about metals, talk about paint, air quality, and just dimension stone, granite, slate, marble, stuff like that. So, whoops, we'll go back. He's next. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff, and you're right on time, too. All right, moving on, our next speaker, Greg Orloff, is with the CSA Group. Greg? Am I on? Oh, there we go. Good afternoon, my name is Greg Orloff. I'm the Government Relations Officer for CSA Group. And I'd like to start by thanking Case Western and all the other sponsors for inviting us here today to participate in this workshop. I think this is a fabulous topic, uh, you may or may not realize yet, but I hope you do by the end of the day, uh, to actually address the topic of conformity assessment and standards in an engineering environment. So, so kudos to everyone who pulled this together, great effort. I'm going to give you a brief overview of CSA Group, uh, just, just a small a little bit of snippets, and then I'm going to try and chum the water if I can a little bit uh, and get us into some uh, dicey topics around the topics and intricacies of standards so we can get a nice interactive dialogue going on. So. Without further ado, if I don't mess up my, uh, oh, flapping back there. Give me some more credit there. This one. All right, CSA's organization, uh, our mission is to provide or create a better, safer, more sustainable world where standards work for people and business. Um, you know, we're not a new organization by any means, uh, but at a high level, what we do to support that vision is we have three areas where we conduct business. We essentially do product performance testing, where you're evaluating a product against uh, maybe manufacturer's claims, things along those lines. We certify products against applicable standards. It could be ours, it could be underwriter laboratories, could be um, ASTMs. And then we also write standards. So we're an SDO, as you heard a little bit about before as well. This will just give you an idea of where we are globally as an organization. Um, we're headquartered right across the pond uh, up in Toronto, Canada. And our US headquarters are just south, about 20 minutes from Cleveland in Independence, Ohio. Just from a, I guess, a capability standpoint, I'm not going to read you guys uh, the stuff that's on this slide, but this will give you an idea of what we do from a testing standpoint. Um, these are some of the marks that we issue as an organization, so you may be familiar with these. You may have seen them on some of your household appliances. Uh, back to your barbecue grills when you're out there grilling at the, uh, the frat parties and such. You don't do that, do you? No keg, keg stands, keg parties? Okay. Anyway, uh, a topic that comes up uh, a lot of times uh, in standards is, is who checks the checker? 
you know, and conformity assessment. So these organizations are out there. You hear this term SDO. That's ANSI's role. Uh, but there are a lot of accreditation bodies that are out there. Uh, these are just some of the ones that cover certifications for the North American environment. Uh, there's topics of energy efficiency that becomes a lot more and more in the limelight in today's day and age. Uh, so you'll see some of the organizations that do that too. Do I want to turn the toggle keys on? No. Where's your keyboard? I don't want to turn the toggle keys. Okay, there we go. We pause for technical difficulties. And once again, just real quickly, uh, some of the international accreditation bodies and recognitions. So, that being said, let's talk about standards and why everyone in this room should care about them. You guys know what a standard is? You've heard a lot of babbling up here from us, but uh, anyone care to throw out a thought or a whim or a concern? Don't all jump at once. All right, fine. I'll, I'll spoon it to you. you know, it's basically a document that tells you how to do, say, make, test, organize, or design something. Uh, okay, so what, right? Well, standards are a baseline. It's a minimum set of criteria for a product or a process. And essentially, it's a living document. So it evolves as products evolve throughout time. You know, so, so why is this important to you as engineers? Uh, good questions. Because most likely, you're going to be working at some time in the not too distant future. Uh, whoever's footing your bills is probably hoping that's sooner than later. Um, but you're probably going to have the uh, potential to work on a product that has to apply with a standard. You may even have the dubious honor of working on a new emerging technology where there are no standards yet, and you can be in the forefront of developing standards for those documents. So it's an extremely relevant topic that uh, doesn't get addressed to a, to a full level or extent oftentimes in engineering and technical schools. So we've heard a little bit about um, the accreditation process and then some a little bit of conversation about the World Trade Organization and technical barriers to trade. Um, ANSI is, is the organization that actually complies with that from an accreditation standpoint in the US. Uh, there's a guiding document in there uh, that we use. It's called ANSI's Essential Requirements, uh, Due Process Requirements for American National Standards, that every one of the organizations on this stage that's represented has to abide by those, those guidelines and, and rules for engagement. Just a couple of figures around that, uh, that comment. Uh, Annex 3 spells out the details that essentially you cannot make a technical document or a standard, a barrier to trade between countries. And some of the statistics that we've got on the board here kind of highlight the benefits that can happen to countries uh, and even regions uh, in North America or Europe, things along those lines, uh, direct economic benefits to society when those things are followed. So in summary, you know, standards can be used to accomplish many different things. Uh, they can establish designs to prevent injury, uh, to laying out technical approaches for verifying energy efficiency, to define proper care techniques for, for medical environments and care, uh, to defining new approaches for topics like cybersecurity. And with that, I think I will close, and uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Greg. Our next speaker today is Howard Wolfman. Howard's with IEEE, or the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody. Are you out there? Hello? <laughs> OK. Um, I, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. I'm really excited about the opportunity to, to sit and talk, or stand and talk, probably a better explanation. Uh, I, I've got a history in standards that goes back many, many decades. We won't go into the details, but uh, I've been involved in IEEE standards. By the way, I'm an IEEE volunteer. I'm not a staff member. Uh, I came from the industry side. I also now am a part-time academic. But I've been involved not only in IEEE standards, but a little bit in ASTM work, and then quite a bit in UL work and CSA work. So I cover a breadth of standards work. A uh, little bit about the IEEE. The IEEE was formed in about 1960, roughly, 59, as a merger of the Institute of Radio Engineers and the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. Today, the IEEE has over 400,000 members. That's globally. Half our members are in North America, and half our members are in the rest of the world. 
We operate over 1,300 annual conferences. We're probably the world's largest publisher of technical information with over 3.5 million technical documents. And we have members in 190 countries, and that demonstrates our, our global position. Our standards are enjoyed by consumers and companies around the world. Uh, you probably recognize IEEE 802.11. Anybody have Wi-Fi? Without that, you wouldn't have Wi-Fi. Or Bluetooth, uh, FireWire. The UL Environmental Sustainable Product Mark is based on an IEEE standard. So these are pervasive. They cover a breadth of, of areas. Uh, we mentioned the internet. We, we also are involved in the power side of the world, uh, networking standards. We even get involved now in patients and care delivery and monitoring equipment. The IEEE has a board of directors, and the particular parts I'd like to focus on are the Educational Activities Board and the Standards Association. These two together operate an IEEE Standards Education Committee. And the Standards Education Committee is just that. It's to provide education and educational information, educational opportunities about standards anywhere from the pre-college level to the college level to the graduate level to the industry level. And as part of this, uh, a team of standards uh, employees and volunteers about two years ago visited many universities, not just in North America, but all over the world, to sit and talk with department heads and with professors and find out what they're doing in terms of bringing standards into the curriculum and what the IEEE can do and assist in that area. Uh, we are globally recognized as a standards developer. We have over 900 active standards, more than 500 standards under development, and out of our volunteers of uh, 400 million, we have over 20,000 standards development worldwide. We are open in membership for standards development. You do not have to be an IEEE member to participate in our standards development. And we follow the WTO, World Trade o Organization, uh, principles for due process, which means you have to have a defined process for developing a standard, openness of standards, where they're open to anybody who wants to participate in the development, reaching consensus on a standard, which means you address anybody who's unhappy about it and address why they're unhappy about it. You don't have to give in, but you have to explain why you're not changing your standard if they raise an objection to it. We also have to have a balance so that industry or academia or any part of industry cannot override what everybody else is doing. And then there's a right of appeal. If somebody is really unhappy and they think the process wasn't followed, they can appeal this to our standards organization. Our development process is fairly standard. Somebody comes up with an idea. Uh, they develop a, recognize a, a sponsor within the institute get a project approved, develop the draft standard, have a ballot, standard reports approved, publication, and then you revise, reinfirm, or withdraw the standard every five or 10 years. Now, how about standards and the engineering student? Well, how, how many here are undergraduate students? How many are graduate students? So it looks like we're basically all undergrads. I got to ask this question. How many are double E's, double E students? How many of you belong to the IEEE? Well, the rest of you, you damn well better join. <laughs> uh, but standards are very important in everybody's life, and many educational institutions don't really focus on standards. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was involved in a conference of professors on the Capstone Project for Senior de Development, and we were talking about bringing standards into the Capstone Projects. So why is this education, standards education, important to you as students? Because you need to recognize the key role that standards play in engineering technology, the computing field, and incorporating standards in the curriculum benefits students and faculty as they face design process challenges. Uh, provides tools for learning about standards. And of course, the knowledge of standards can help you make the transition. Eventually, you gotta make this transition, right? From the classroom, to professional practice, be that in industry or in academia. And other parts of the world, other, other 
disciplines would also profit from standards work. So we have something called the IEEE Standards University. Uh, it's being developed now. We have multi-track projects, a three-year plan. We're working on this. And one thing I do want to mention that's, that's important is we provide grants. We provide grants to students uh, working on projects so long as they involve IEEE standards or possibly other standards. And if you want to learn more about those grants, uh, contact our staff folks whose name and contact information is at the end of this presentation. Speaking of that, here's where you can learn more about IEEE standards. Uh, our IEEE Explorer, and I suspect the university has a subscription to that, so you can probably get it through the library. If they don't, they should. Do they have a subscription? They have standards, but not the program. Okay. Uh, then you can also learn about it, our, our standards portal, IEEE standards select, and get program. And these are the names and the contact of the folks that you need to talk to. Susan Tatainer or Jennifer McLean can tell you more about the student grants that we have. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. And our final speaker for the first panel is uh, Brad Schmidt, and he's with Underwriters Laboratories. Thank you. Thank you, Bradley, for that introduction. It's a, a great pleasure to be here to talk about standards with uh, my colleagues here at Case Western and on the panel. Uh, who, uh, who all has heard of Underwriters Laboratories? Raise your hand. All right, good. Quite a few of you have. circuit breakers to cybersecurity, and from smoke alarms to solar panels. UL's standards is part of Underwriters Laboratories, Inc. It's a uh, not-for-profit entity, and our focus is public safety. We've been doing this work uh, for well over 110 years. We started back in uh, about 1903. Now, this picture here is uh, from the Columbia Exposition in Chicago, and, and particularly the, the Hall of Lights, it was called. Now, back in 1890, electricity was a big thing. It's like an iPhone 8 or 9. <laughs> the only difference is electricity catches stuff on fire if you're not careful with it. And, and that's what happened. A lot of things caught on fire or wires melted, fuses would blow, but they'd only blow once or twice because then somebody would stick a piece of copper pipe in the fuse holder and everything was fine. <laughs> so, uh, so the insurance uh, folks that looked at this and said, hey, we, we need to uh, have somebody say this stuff is safe before we're going to insure it. And boom, Underwriters Laboratories was born. We've been doing that ever since. We published almost 1,500 standards or uh, other documents that uh, deal with public, uh, product safety. Now, what are the drivers of standards? Obviously, the needs of society. Like I said, people don't like it when their house catches on fire. So we have to, to, have to protect the public from fire, shock, casualty hazards, and, and more recently, cyber attack. These new and innovative technologies they have to be studied, researched, and proper safety requirements put in place. And in fact, uh, as I mentioned, science and research, that's a good way to develop standards because the more you know about a product, the more you understand it, and, you know, and the more you understand the hazards. How are standards created? Well, at UL, we have a standards technical panel, and it consists of experts from, uh, from industry, uh, consumers, academia, users of the product, inspection authorities like the, the local electrical inspector. They're on many of our, our standards technical panels. And anyone else who's interested, anyone can be a member of the panel. And we gather this, this group of experts together and, and create and publish these standards for safety. The future of standards from UL's perspective, it's renewable energies. Uh, solar, wind, batteries, especially there's some huge lithium ion batteries in cars these days, so 
there's some safety concerns there. Wearable technologies like body cameras, 3D printing, we heard a lot about that today on our tour. Drones, it's just a matter of time before everybody has a drone in their backyard or in their driveway. So we better start thinking about that. Interoperability, functional safety, and cybersecurity. Those are, those are fancy words. What that means is smart devices that control equipment. And we heard about that today, uh, controlling an Instron machine from your smartphone. Very interesting. What we want to ensure is that that machine hears your command, it understands it, and reacts safely, and it can't be hacked. UL also feels that the future of standards is in science and research. That's going to drive the standards development process. And that research is going to be done by UL, uh, academia, and manufacturers. So this is a very exciting time, I think, to be in the standards uh, area. And the timing of this uh, standards workshop could not have come at a better time. So thank you for your time today. Thanks, Brad. Uh, that concludes our first panel, and we'd like to open up the floor for uh, questions. If you would, please come down to the mic so we can uh, hear you and get it on tape. Any questions, comments? <laughs> I, I represent the library, right? And I typically mention that we should get. Why are you so expensive to get? <laughs> and why do we impose so many uh, licensing restrictions to the libraries? We want them to have access to the standards, right? Yeah, who would like to feel that? Uh, <laughs> Not. <laughs> yeah, why, why are the standards so expensive? Why aren't there licensing, licensing agreements for the schools? and? colleges and so forth. I can offer one thing, Daniela, on behalf of ANSI, and I don't speak for ANSI, but I'm aware that they have this resource, which is a website where many SDOs, my own SDO included, have posted read-only access to standards. So yes. to the extent it's useful to, to be online and, and look at them, you, you know, the students can do that. Yes. I don't know about the printing and, you know, the, and the copying, but online access is out there. I think a lot of SDOs are doing that now just um, as an extra way to put standards out there without necessarily cutting into the important revenue stream that it provides to all the nonprofit SEOs, which we all are. Yes. I, I can probably comment a little bit on that as well. Uh, and that's, uh, in the IEEE, there's a whole series of 802 standards for communications. And the policy is after they're, six months after they're published, they're available for free. Okay. So that's a start. That's a start. Uh, there is a cost associated with developing all of these standards. And unfortunately today, uh, there's a big legal cost associated with standards because we live in a litigious society and everybody sues. <laughs> right? <laughs> so it all adds up to the cost, which makes, makes for a challenge in trying to keep the standards as affordable as possible. But we're, we're very, as, as SDOs, I, we're all very cognizant of, of the cost of our standards. Thank you. Oh, I have one thing to add. Okay. Um, so for our committees, if you're a member, after the document is published, the committee members do get free copies. So let's say you're a student, you're a member. Now you can't distribute to other people, but you could have your own private copy. Okay. So I'll just add one more comment. I mentioned this during my presentation, and that's IEEE Explore. If the university subscribes to that, uh, students at the university can get copies of all of the standards at no cost. Yes, <laughs> they pay tuition. <laughs> right, right, right. Thanks. Uh, another question. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Sorry. Okay. Um, 
when a new technology or uh, like a new material is developed in lab and in either industry or in a university, how do you create the standards? Do you wait for that new material to be used in the industry or do you wait for some sort of patenting license to happen? Like how does that, how does that all work? Greg, you want to sure. comment? That's a great question. Uh, a lot of times technology and innovation you know, will lead in the development of one new material, one new product. Uh, if you look at a lot of the things that we as organizations write standards about or certify, it's a model or a product line. You, know, you heard toasters, you heard uh, you know, barbecue grills, things along those lines. There's multiple manufacturers that are man making those products. So when you have a new and emerging or evolving technology or a product per se, you can develop a, tech, a technical standard or a, we call them requirements. I can't remember what UL's term for it is, but the organizations that do conformity assessment can work with a manufacturer for that, of that product to develop a methodology to evaluate the safety features of that product. Then once that product gets commercialized and it starts to go through that process, more, competi yeah, excuse me, more competition is going to enter into the stream. You're going to have other people making it, other people using it, and it'll evolve to a point where then you have multiple folks engaged. You can develop a standard around that product line. There's another issue when it comes to a new product, and that's the world of patents. If I'm a company and I have a new product and I have it really tied up in patents, and I want uh, one of the SDOs to develop a standard, they're going to say, wait a minute, you've got that patented. Are there other people interested in using that product or in manufacturing that product? You as a patent holder have got to declare what patents you have and agree that you will provide uh, reasonable access uh, to other companies to those patents. Otherwise, you can't build a standard around a patented product. A lot of the product standards are performance-based, and that means you can, you can build it out of anything you want, provided it passes performance tests, like flammability or impact testing or, or uh, its ability to withstand uh, a load at elevated temperatures. So it's not necessarily as much material-based as uh, performance-based many times. Okay, Jeff? Just from an AS10 perspective, uh, a lot of what's been said, we agree with as well. Like, you don't bring patents into a standard. If you're going to bring your thing to ASTM to write a standard about whatever it is, ASTM is going to get the copyright for that standard and everything that's published about that, so if there's data and everything else associated with that. And the reason that we do that is ASTM has to be impartial, and we won't write a standard around your particular piece of equipment. Some other folks may do something like that, but from an ASTM perspective, we're going to write, like I've mentioned, the CRAN standard. You might have the best CRAN in the world, you know? You might not be having the one that has asbestos in it now that they're complaining about. So you're going to bring that. But that standard is going to address all CRANs. It's not going to address just yours. Okay? So it's important for the standards to be, you know, they got to be very particular, very technical, and very precise, but they can't be biased towards one product over another. All right. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Um, my question is, if somebody wants to put the underwriter's sticker or some other standard sticker on their product, are they responsible for completing some testing that certifies that their product or whatever it is is up to the standard? Or is that something that the uh, organizations that you guys represent are responsible for? And then what happens if that product is then to fail uh, like against what that standard promises or certifies? That one. Uh, <laughs> yes, a, a manufacturer of a product will submit his product to underwriters' laboratories, or CSA for that matter, and we will use the published standard in effect and, and, and test it to that standard. And if it conforms with the standard, boom, you get to put the label on it. If it does not, we'll tell you where it fell short and you're at liberty to improve it and resubmit and try again. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good. Anybody else? Jeff? Well, ASTM, we don't have certification programs. We started getting into that recently, but we don't. What we have is something that somebody self-declares. Like if you're going to wear, if you go to a bicycle 
buy a bicycle helmet, and it's going to say conforms with ASTM D something, I'm not sure, or F something, I'm not sure what the number would be. It's a, the onus is on that manufacturer to prove to you as the user that it conforms to that ASTM standard. Basically what he just said that UL does for the manufacturers. But people can self-declare within ASTM and it's on them to prove that. Now if they do that and we never, you know, we don't have a policing agency to go get somebody to do something. ASTM doesn't function that way. We will do some things. I remember there's a case where somebody put an ASTM logo on solder. Because you put the logo on there, it's going to make imply that ASTM verified that, certified that solder is proper. And that wasn't the case. So the lawyers get involved, which was mentioned earlier, and that's why standards cost money. Um, and so they get involved and ask them to cease and desist. So we'll go protect the copyright from that perspective. Hey. Oh, I, could, I could answer the same thing. A Amy is similar to ASTM. We do not have a testing facility. We don't have conformity assessment. However, medical devices are highly regulated, so they have to go through the FDA. Now, FDA will use our standards um, because they're voluntary consensus standards. There are some manufacturers who will put their um, label saying this is Amy certified, but that doesn't mean we certified anything. Thanks. I have a follow-up question, if that's OK, too. Sure. Or do you want to? <laughs> well, to that end, I'm wondering, I know that sometimes federal regulations take a long time to sort of come out into the open. And I imagine that at certain times, your standards actually come out before the federal regulations on a certain product or process. Um, do you guys work in conjunction to try and make those federal regulations as safe as they need to be or as least restrictive as they can be? Greg? <laughs> That's a, that's a tangled web question. Uh, <laughs> um, I would say as often as we can, we'll work in parallel with the government, whether it's at the state level or the federal level, uh, to develop consensus-based standards. Uh, the U.S. government and the Canadian government as well uh, have a preference by legislation, I, I believe, to point to a consensus-based American or Canadian national document, if one exists as opposed to writing regulation. Uh, it's generally more efficient to have someone other than the government writing something along those lines. So a lot of times you'll see the government point to, and it's a topic that we could go down a whole big uh, discussion on, is incorporation by reference. Um, but essentially, if, if that document gets pulled in by reference, it, the government doesn't have to write a regulation. They can just say it needs to conform with ASTM, the 963, I think, is the toy standard. That's one of the few standards that's actually mandatory. Uh, a lot of the other standards that are out there are, are voluntary, but they can be made, I would say, quasi-mandatory due to the retail environment. Uh, if you go to one of the big box retailers, uh, those consensus-based standards may be a voluntary standard, but they're not going to put the product on their shelves unless it meets the requirements. And that's where you get kind of that, that secondary uh, re requirement, so to speak, that these things need to conform. I've got one, one more comment about... Uh the mark on the product, the safety mark in particular, be it a UL mark or a CSA mark. And both my colleagues, I'm sure, will vouch for this, and that's the word counterfeit. Uh, I, I've seen examples. I was at the CSA annual conference uh, in June, and they had a table full of counterfeit products that had come in off from, primarily from offshore, and it's the same thing with UL. I, I was at a National Electrical Manufacturers Association Trade Association meeting, and a vice president of UL, uh, whose job is counterfeiting, or not counterfeiting, but counterfeit products with you, bearing the UL mark, uh, talked about the raids that he's made in conjunction with the federal government into warehouses where you find products coming in from offshore that have a phony mark. He made one other comment, and I'll describe it a little bit. He used a specific store name. I'll, I'll just say his comment was, if you go to a store that sells products for a dollar and they're electrical or electronic, they're probably counterfeit. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thanks. Monty, you want to say something? Yeah, I'll add uh, three things. Uh, going in reverse order, I get calls all the time from customs agents saying, we have a whole shipload of stuff with your mark on it. Can you verify that this is legitimate or not? Well, then we have to go back and try and figure out what it is, you know, can, what information can you give me, what can our staff look at to try and determine what that is. But the customs agents, uh, very much to Howard's point, they're looking all the time, what is this stuff? We can't verify what it is. We need the certifier to tell us. 
Uh, going back one step before that, I found that uh, especially the federal government, but also state agencies, they're not very nimble. I mean, except for certain cases, they can't move very quickly. So an SDO might be doing something quickly. They might be updating their codes or standards much more quickly than a state or the federal government has the ability to do so. So it's sort of dog chasing tail a little bit. And then the other thing I wanted to mention was that I think you'll find across uh, product certification, some certifiers do product testing in-house, some will have you go to a third party and bring those results in and have the engineers look at it and certify based on that. So it can be um, all about which certifier you choose for your product to determine maybe what the different steps would be for certification. Okay, thanks. Next question. I'm curious about your thoughts on proprietary specifications and standards. So um, things that are not created by a, a large organization like yourselves, but um, by a manufacturer or someone in industry. Because um, uh, from my experience working with a mix of the you know, standards um, from like ASTM and um, then also from specific manufacturers, um, not only is it cost prohibitive to work with those because there's so many that you have to use, but um, just calling out all the different ones and trying to get access to them can be quite difficult. Um, so I guess kind of what are your thoughts on um, manufacturers creating their own standards and uh, are your companies doing, or groups doing anything to kind of combine everything and you know, make it more standardized? Collins? No. <laughs> I'll, I'll say uh, very briefly, before I became involved with standards, I didn't know what they were. And then very shortly after becoming involved with standards, I met someone who his job at his organization was to make proprietary standards, in-house standards for their manufacturing. And that blew my mind. I didn't even know that was something people did. The amount of time and resources they spend to create standards just for themselves. And I guess it's a, it's a cost benefit analysis for them and they need that to operate. But it just seems so interesting to me that this person's job and his whole you know, team of people from his company, that's what they work on. Standards just for them, not for anybody else, not for sale. Nobody would want them anyway because it's how Widget X is made by this particular company. I, th I thought that was very interesting. I didn't realize that was something that occurred. Yeah, just to add to that a little bit, I think there's, uh, there, are, there are levels and nuances of what, what we classify as a standard versus an operating procedure versus a protocol. So there's a lot of vernacular and a lot of abbreviations and acronyms in this industry. You'll go blind. I think it's worse than the military, actually, from that standpoint. But if, if you're writing a document, there's nothing wrong with an organization writing their own operating procedures or assembly procedures. I think where there's an added benefit with what you do through an ANSI process or any consensus-based process is that rudimentary word consensus. So you're bringing together a cross-section of a bunch of different disciplines that have one common interest, one common goal, and that's to develop, in, in the case we're talking about, a, a safe product, product X. And there's oftentimes it's said that when you have a, a truly sound and truly good consensus-based standard, no one walks out of the room happy, but they walk out of the room with something they can live with. So all that collective input brings something. So you, you get rid of those individual biases uh, that may be around intellectual property ties or giving someone a competitive advantage. Because, you know, let's face it, every time someone comes to the table, they're bringing their own agenda. So that process tries to minimize that nothing gets control over that, either from a balance or a bias standpoint. At the same time, in an open market society, such as the one we have in North America, any company can come up with their own product uh, as long as it meets whatever safety requirements or federal requirements may be involved. Uh, it could be a protocol. I, I happen to be involved in the lighting industry, and there's one major lighting company that has its own communication protocol, and they've been very successful with it, but nobody else can use it because they've got it patented. But they're free to do that if they wish, but other people can't use it. So I'm also involved in some ANSI work now where we're trying to develop uh, some open protocols. So we'll see how that plays out. Just with your frustration that if you come across a standard that you think is cumbersome or isn't very effective, you could probably join any one of these organizations and affect change. That's the beauty of an ASTM, and I've heard it repetitively with other folks here. Anybody can join. 
And that's what happens, and that'll bring somebody into the room. They might think they have the best standard written, but you come up and you bring your perspective, they'll listen to it and they might reluctantly agree, or they might not be too happy and they leave mad, but you can affect the change to that standard. And that's what every student and every person sitting in here could do that, regardless what organization they wanted to join. on the panel today. So how much overlap do you see between individual standards bodies? A lot of the standards are based on performance or safety. So are there instances of overlap for the same type of product, same type of performance? And when there is overlap between different organizations, how do you get to some consensus between ISO and some other organization? That's right. I just made a comment to my colleagues. I'm sitting in the perfect seat between the two of them right now. <laughs> they are expanding their spheres of influence. Uh, one is going south, one is going north. And uh, it's an interesting question, and I don't know how things like that get resolved. Maybe the market will end up resolving it. Well, I, I can tell you. <laughs> Let me answer that question if I may. Uh, this is where ANSI comes in. If we're going to... Uh, if we're thinking about writing a standard on widgets and we want it to be ANSI approved, we'll, we'll send a note to ANSI and say, hey, we're getting ready to work on this. And ANSI will publish it for all to see. And if CSA says, hey, we already got a standard for widgets, and we'll say, oh, yes, you do. Okay, we're going to back off on that. And it's a give and take between the, the standards development organizations. Where there's gaps, then we fill them. If there's overlap, Nobody wants to do the work twice. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, there's actually times, too, and believe it or not, we will collaborate on topics, too. Um, you know, do joint ventures. Sometimes there's a, the trifecta, if you will. You may have three organizations that are drafting standards. But, but it's a great point. I mean, there's, there's a, meth, or a mechanism that exists within ANSI to, to vet that. Uh, it'll usually come down to a discussion between the organizations that, that, that want to draft the document. There's a PINS process, a project identification notification, I can't remember what the S stands for, system, uh, which essentially is that submission that we were talking about, where you, you send that in there and say, hey, I, I have an intent to write this, I've got people that have an interest. Uh, and that's, that's the opportunity for anyone that is either down the path already or starting to come to the table and say, hey, we'd like to do that too, or we already have it. It's my understanding, and speaking now more for IATMO than for ANSI, ANSI, they don't want to referee, they don't want to choose your standard was first, you were right, your standard is second, so that's wrong. It does want to force the parties to communicate, and if they can resolve it, great. If they can't resolve it, and the second standard in all other ways meets the designation for an American national standard such that it can be granted that status, I think it'll probably get that status simply because it's not about choosing. It's about the parties working together to either to find a resolution or in some cases to not find one. And I could add to it, um, internationally, <laughs> At least between the IEC and the ISO groups, um, sometimes we form joint working groups. So, for example, IEC deals with all the electrotechnical um, equipment, and ISO deals with all the other things out there. But we have several joint working groups where they come to the and, we, and one either from IEC or ISO will take the lead on the project, but they'll invite the members from the other side to come to all the meetings and participate. And so that's how it gets resolved. We have within AMI, so we're medical, but UL has an interoperability um, section, and we have an interoperability section just for the medical devices. So we have an MOU um, between the two organizations, and they have a group that, that, work, that work on the standards together. Okay, Janet, uh, we got time for more questions? Are we breaking? Or... Any more questions? Hi, I have a question on what you do when standards seem to be uh, inhibiting um, unity instead of helping it. So in my mind, I'm thinking of IEEE 1394 versus USB that sort of divided the industry for a while instead of unified it. So I was wondering what, how you deal with that and then also how you let a standard die, like IEEE 1394. Howard? When you 
develop a standard, there's, there's a line you have to walk, of course, or you try to walk, between inhibiting creativity and allowing creativity. Uh, sometimes you hit it, sometimes you're on one side or the other side. Uh, if things have changed as time passes, then it's time to revise the standard to make it uh, more amenable to fostering creativity. Uh, if you have some particular thoughts on the standard, I would strongly encourage you to get in touch with one of the folks that I mentioned at IEEE staff, bring your thoughts to their attention, and ask them to put you in touch with the right people who are involved in a particular standard, and see if you can get it changed. Greg? Just a quick addition to that. There's, once again, part of the ANSI process. There's a public review for all of these documents. Uh, is it's a part of the process that's incorporated. So that's where anyone in the universe could potentially vo voice in and raise an issue, and that document goes out for public review. Uh, every standard that's an American national standard, and, and a Canadian for that matter, is, there's a, a set five-year maximum time frame that that standard will be refreshed. Some of them are refreshed a lot sooner than that. So when that window of opportunity comes up, Raise your hand. Submit something to either the TAG or, or the, uh, the Standards Development Committee that's, that's in charge of that product, which, whichever SDO it happens to be residing with, and uh, your voice can be heard. I want to thank you for that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> ASTM standards don't go out to public review. There, some of ASTM standards are American national standards, but most of the standards that are written by ASTM are reviewed by the 30,000 members of ASTM that look at it and review it. So they'd be limiting for that, so you would have to join, but anybody could, could join. And we actually have a standards tracking service that you can sign up to a particular industry, and when a revision is happening to a particular standard, you as a non-member can review that and reach out to ASTM and try to affect change. We also have the same five-year review policy, but within ASTM, what's really nice about it, it can be revised at any time. You know, and I would say there's something. When I was in the Army a long time ago, we always said something about fresh eyes or tired eyes. It was tired eyes. Because you'll get somebody, these guys, ASTM, and it might be true for some of the other organizations, we actually have members that have been ASTM members for 50 years or more. And I mean, you look at anything for 50 years and even I start to look better. But, um, I'm sorry. But no, if you look at anything for 50 years, it's just, you know, you might miss something. I've had situations in ASTM standards where there may have been a, a a particular section that had a formula wrong, and it may have been in print for 10 years. I mean, seriously, because people look at it and they use that because we use that standard every day. We go into that lab, I know how to do this, and they don't read it. And your boss showed you how to use it as a new tech coming into the lab, and it just goes that way and nobody looks at it. But then we'll get somebody with fresh eyes and review that, and they'll come in, and that's part of the beauty of ASTM. Everybody has an equal voice. And you bring in that thing, discrepancy or whatever the problem is, and we'll look at it and we'll say, man, actually the guys have been here for 50 years will be embarrassed that it's been here that long. But then they'll get a, we'll get it fixed. Yeah, and I guess I'd like to add, if you're a company that has a vested interest in one of these standards, you better send a, a committee member to that committee and work on that standard or you, you may be shut out. So you want to have your opinions heard as, as well. Assume that uh, an entrepreneur create a device and it got UL certification, it got CSA certification, and somebody purchased that item and it failed. So who is responsible in this situation? Was there any occasion or any instances that uh, a certified device failed, fired, or led to something unusual? Can you repeat the question? No, no just kidding. Uh, yeah, that can happen, it's some, and that's where CPSC gets involved. Uh, but also, who knows what, what it could have been. Maybe there's a manufacturing process that was off. Um, it, it's hard. It, you can't say that the product failed because it didn't comply with the standard. It, that's, that's, that's a tough statement to make. There, there's so many things that can, can go haywire along the lines. Uh, but it does happen, yeah. A, a product that, that uh, has a listing mark uh, fails in the field. 
and, and we uh, have uh, folks that investigate those things. Well, I'm, again, I'm in the middle between my two colleagues, but uh, what I have been taught by them is that a product that bears the mark, basically that says at the time the product left the factory, it complied with the safety standard, period. I'll add a little nuance to that. Um, the certification, uh, you're certifying a model of something. It, it's important to understand that the certification is not quality control. So UL, CSA, we're not in your factories 24-7 running your production lines to make sure everything that's coming off that line is, is Johnny spot on. Our job is to make sure that what you tell us you're going to make and the components that you're using in that are indeed what you're doing. And we have an audit program and a surveillance program that does that. And when we do have a failure in the field, much the same as UL, we have a whole group that goes out and audits and investigates those situations, if need be, to look into that. Yeah, I would adopt those comments 100 percent, what you all said. And you know, the fact of the matter is products fail all the time for a variety of reasons. And the manufacturers are strictly liable because the manufacturer bears the gain from selling the product. The certifier does not bear any such gain. The certifier takes their fee for doing their work and therefore is not considered to be liable for the product failure unless, of course, you go to court and prove your case and say this certifier failed to do their job for X, Y, and Z reasons. Uh, one, one other thing, again, sitting between my two friends. I think we're still friends. Uh, UL and CSA are concerned basically about three things. Sharp edges, fire safety, and shock hazard. Uh, not performance. If it fails a day after it leaves the factory on a performance issue, that's not a safety issue. That's a manufacturer issue. Manufacturers have warranties. Sometimes they're very short, 30 days, one year, five years, 10 years. Then you've got to read the fine print in the warranty to see if it's really useful. But performance is different than safety. All right, I think we're due for a break now, and we're coming back at what time? 5.30 for the next panel. Can we give a round of applause to our first panel?